Today we're going to look a little bit more at the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I want to start this video out by first of all having you work out this definite integral using the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Just stop the video, work it out, and once you're finished, start the video again and check your work. Alright, so to apply the first fundamental theorem, we know that if we have a continuous function across a continuous interval, which we do here, we can take the antiderivative of the function, which is as shown, and then evaluate our antiderivative at the top limit of integration. I'm just going to pull the quarter out there. So plug the x into t, x squared subtracted by the bottom limit of integration plugged in, 1 squared. And so in this case we get a formula which represents the area under this curve, just to draw it out. This is t and this is y. There's a half t. This definite integral represents the area between t equals 1 and t equals x. And so this formula, which we often call the area function, gives us the net signed area under the graph between 1, which is our starting point in this case, up to x. So depending on what x is, we get a different area. So just using this animation, if we wanted to know the area between 1 and 3, we could plug 3 into our formula here. 3 squared is 9 minus 1 is 8, divided by 4 is 2. This net area would be 2. And in the second graph, what I have here is a graph of the area function itself. At 3, the net signed area is 2. So for every value of x, there's a different net signed area between 1 and x. And if you go to the left of your starting point 1, you can get negative and positive net signed areas. Now the next thing I'd like you to do is to take your answer from above and do the derivative of the antiderivative we just calculated. Just stop the video, give that a shot, and then restart the video when you're finished. Alright, so we're doing the derivative of our answer above. We're doing the derivative of this definite integral. And so the derivative of a constant times a function would be the constant times the derivative of the variable part, which would be that. And we ended up with a half x. And you'll notice that your half x is the same thing we began with, except that the t has changed to x. So if we call this f of t, the derivative of our integral of f of t in the end became f of x. And this was our area function. So just to notate this a bit more, the derivative of a of x was a prime of x. And so what we're saying is that the derivative of our area function, the derivative of our definite integral is the original function we started with at x instead of t. Now this is the essential point of the second fundamental theorem of calculus that I'm going to get to in a moment. But just before we do that, just in terms of visually what's going on here, if I go back to my animation and I take the derivative of my area function, the derivative of my definite integral, you'll notice that the third graph, which is the derivative of the definite integral, a prime of x, that a prime of x graph, the third one, is the same as our original graph, f, in terms of x, f of x. So you can see how f of x is the same as a prime of x. The derivative of the antiderivative is the original function back again, which should make sense because integration and differentiation are uh, inverse operations of one another.
just going to show you one more thing with the animation. Just back to my, my, my example here. Um, had I done, let's say, the net signed area between negative 2 and x, back to my animation, just watch how the area function changes as I, as I change my starting point. Instead of doing the area from 1 to x, what if I did it from somewhere else? Negative 2. You notice that as I change the starting point, the area function stays the same other than it gets shifted up and down. And of course the reason for that would be, back to my calculations, had this number at the bottom changed, all of these parts of my work would have changed, and so my area function would have been a little different. It still would have been parabolic, but it would have been shifted up and down because of the constant effect at the end. However, in terms of the derivative of the area function, the derivative of the antiderivative, had this number changed, this still would have been zero here. And so my a prime of x would have still have been the same as my f of x, no matter, no matter what my starting point. Notice that the third graph doesn't change but the area function does change. All right, so there's lots of things going on here. What is the essential point we're trying to get at? Well, it's this. The second fundamental theorem of calculus says that if we have a continuous function on an interval, and the example I was using was 2t between 1 and x, and if we define this net signed area as some function called a of x, then, if we were to do the derivative of our definite integral, we would get the original function, but not in terms of t, in terms of x. In other words, the derivative of our antiderivative would be the original function that we started with. f with that plugged in. And as we just said, it wouldn't matter what the constant on the bottom was. As long as it's within a continuous interval with x, the derivative of the antiderivative would still be this, no matter what this constant is. Stated another way, the second fundamental theorem says if you take the derivative of the definite integral, if you take the derivative of your definite integral, you're going to get the original function back with the x plugged in. All right, so you might wonder of what value is this concept? It just seems to be saying that if we take the derivative of an integral, we'll get back what we started with. That just seems to make intuitive sense. But why is this result important and what could it be used for? So here's an example where I have a function big F defined as a definite integral big F being the net signed area under this function, which I'm calling F of T. And F of T looks something like this. And so big F of X represents the net signed area from zero to X under this graph. So you might wonder, can we figure out what the equation for big F is? Well, we would be able to do that if we knew how to anti-differentiate little f. If you think about that for a moment, we don't know how to do that. But just because we don't know how to do this doesn't mean that big F doesn't exist. We know it does exist because there is area between 0 and x under this function as long as we're talking about 0 and x on a continuous interval. All right, so this sounds very complicated. You're saying Big F of X exists, we just can't find the actual equation because we don't know how to anti-differentiate this. Correct. So then you might wonder, well, can I actually f figure out what big F is if I can't actually anti-differentiate it? Actually, there's a lot of things you can figure out, and here are some of them. So for example, we can figure out the domain of big F. All right, so you say, well, how do I do that? First of all, I have to look at little f, and I have to look at the domain of little f. And if I think about that, I'll say, well, t can be anything as long as t isn't negative 1. 
Okay, anything on both sides would work on the domain of F. What does that therefore mean though for the domain of big F? According to the second fundamental theorem, the values that work for X have to be in a continuous interval with zero across this function. So if I look up at my number line for little f, here's zero, and we want to have our x values in a continuous interval with zero, which means we can use anything greater than negative one. And that, therefore, is my domain for big F. X is greater than negative one, where X is a real number. What else can we figure out? What about a zero of the function, an x-intercept for big F? Are we able to find a value of x where f of x is zero? Well, since our big F of x is a definite integral, are there any values of x that we know will make that entire definite integral equal to zero? Well, we know that when these two things are equal, the value of the definite integral will come out to zero. In other words, we know that an x-intercept of big F will be x equals zero. So we've, cal we've found a point on big F even though we don't know the equation of big F. We know a point on it, we know its domain. Here's something else we can calculate. The derivative of big F. We don't know the equation of big F without the integral, but we can get the derivative of big F because the second fundamental theorem says that the derivative of our definite integral, of our antiderivative, will be this function with x plugged in, provided that we're going from a constant to x, which we are. So the derivative of f prime will be sine x over 1 plus x, which is the same as our original with the x plugged in. So we have the first derivative of big F, even though we don't have the equation for big F. Of what value is that? Well, you'll remember from our study of positive and negative derivatives, if we know when a derivative is positive or negative, we will know where the original function is increasing or decreasing. So for example here, if I'm dealing with a domain greater than negative one, I'm going to know that my denominator is always going to be positive and therefore my numerator will be positive or negative depending on my values of x. And so we could go through all of that and we could figure out where big F is increasing and decreasing without actually knowing the equation for big F. Similarly we could find the second derivative for big F and figure out the concavity of big F without actually knowing the equation of big F. So what I'm trying to say is that we can graph and get a lot of information about a given function in definite integral notation even though we may not be able to reduce it to a nice clean formula. See how the calculator is able to graph big F of x using the definite integral notation. That is one of the powers of the second fundamental theorem. Finally, just to wrap things up, um, you can also, with the second fundamental theorem of calculus concept, take the derivative of a definite integral not just going from a constant to x, but a constant to a function of x. And that would involve the chain rule. And so, since we're just applying the chain rule to this concept, we're going to plug our u into here if we're doing the derivative to get f of u and then apply the chain rule by multiplying that by the derivative of our u, g prime of x. And so we can finish that off with the derivative of this being f of u, which is g of x, f of g of x times g prime of x. So there's the essence of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. It's a challenging concept. It's going to take you a little while to get your head around, but Hang in there, stay positive, stay happy, ask questions, and uh, things will get better. Right, Sasha?